okay so now the next one is this exercise here we have a finite group g and a normal subgroup n and it is given that in the factor group g by n there is an element of order 42 we have to prove that the original group g also has an element of order 42 that is the first part and in the second part it's asked if the same thing is true if g is an i mean in an infinite group so let us first see the first part so it's given that this factor group has an element of order 42 so let us consider one such element let the coset a n because we will have cosets as elements in the factor group belong to the factor group such that its order is 42 now it's of course understood that this element a is coming from g the original group now since g is finite a has finite order that is the order of a is finite then we have already seen one theorem in which uh, it is stated that the order of the coset a n divides the order of the element a so 42 will now divide the order of a hence by so here is the theorem number 4, 7, 42 divides the order of A. Let 42M be equal to the order of A, where M is a positive integer okay then what is the 42nd power of the uh, element a to the power m by applying one of the rules of exponents this is nothing but a to the power 42 m which is this and this by the definition of the order of an element is e okay so we uh, now have the fact that the 42nd power of the element a to the power m is e now suppose we have this equal to e for some positive integer n less than 42 if we suppose this then what what is it that we will get for some positive integer n less than 42 then we have okay then from this equation what do we get using again that rule of exponent we get 
this. Note that n is a positive integer, m is also a positive integer. So, m n is a positive integer, but this is a contradiction since m n is a positive integer less than 42 m because n is less than 42 and this 42 m is nothing but the order of a. So, the minimal nature of the order of a is violated. So, that is why this cannot be true that means our supposition is wrong. So, the last supposition is wrong ie so that just simply means what now it means that the 42nd power of a to the power m is the identity but no smaller power in which the exponent is positive is uh, it can be identity so that's why the order of a to the power m is equal to 42. So, that is how starting from an element a n of order 42 in the factor group, we have found an element again of order 42, but in the original group. Now, next comes the question of whether this is also always the case if the group is infinite and the answer is no. Consider the additive group of integers. the additive group of integers, the normal subgroup, this which is the cyclic group generated by the integer 42 and it consists of all integer multiples of 42. We already know that this is a subgroup of z and uh, it is normal because the original group is abelian and the element one in our original group. Note that the order of this coset of uh, well, we cannot write n because we are not calling it n, but this. This means the order of the coset 1 plus uh, this cyclic subgroup in the factor group is 42. It is not very difficult to see why. You keep on adding copies of this coset with uh, itself. You will see that unless you add 42 copies, if you add smaller number of copies, you are never going to get uh, the identity element in the factor group, which is this group itself. Only when you add 42 copies, you are going to get the identity. So that is why the order is 42 in, in uh, order to clarify that this order is being calculated in the factor group. You can say this in the in this factor group. 
So that means in this case, our an, which is 1 plus this subgroup, has order 42, just like what is uh, given in the original statement of the problem. But there is no element of order 42 in the additive group of integers. In fact, uh, there is only one element of finite order in this group, which is the identity element 0. Its order is 1. All the other elements, that is any non-identity, any non-zero element has infinite order. Since the order of 0 is 1 and every non-identity element in the original group has infinite order this lacks any element of order 42. So, if our group is infinite, then there is no guarantee that such an element will exist. So, that is the solution. Let us now see the next one. Let n be a normal subgroup of G. Show that Factor group G over N is abelian if and only if there is a condition A inverse B inverse A B belongs to N for all elements A and B in G. Okay, so let us now see how this can be done. So that means now we have a group and th there is nothing uh, about finiteness or infiniteness of the group and we do not need also. It is any group, it may be finite, may be infinite, but a normal subgroup is given n. So we can consider the factor group g over, uh, I mean uh, g by n. So this factor group will be abelian if and only if this such uh, elements are called commutators, okay, I mean uh, such a product, if all commutators belong to N, that is for all A and B in G. Okay, so that means we have two implications to prove. Uh, Let us first consider that G of G by N is abelian and prove that this is the case and then it is converse. Let this be abelian. Then for any elements A and B I need to clean this uh, these 
rags but the maid is not coming i will have to do it tomorrow then for any elements a and b in g we have so now we know that uh, g over n is abelian so any two cosets will commit in particular these two cosets will commute okay so let us now see what this equality gives us this implies if we just simply apply the definition of uh, the binary operation in a factor group this is a b n and this is b a n okay this implies now if we consider this then obviously on this side we are going to get only n but still i am just writing one more step and if you apply the rule that you know uh, which tells us how to write down the inverse of a product it's the product of the inverses but the order is changed here you have ba here you have a inverse b inverse and this of course just is um, simply n now what are the elements that you have in this coset that appears on the left side the elements look like this this times some element of n if that some element of n you choose to be the identity element then you get just this element so this element belongs to this coset so it also has to belong to n so that means Okay, so that's how we have this condition. Now, conversely, let so this is now our hypothesis. We have to prove that the factor group is abelian then for any elements x and y in g we have once you become quite comfortable with this kind of uh, arguments here itself you can incorporate the converse observer by uh, following these uh, steps in the reverse order but i am not going to do that now it depends on you how much you are comfortable with that kind of things that kind of uh, i mean uh, way of writing something which compresses the length of your solution you should not simply do it if you are not comfortable with it only after dealing with these things for quite some time then you get to know what the things are that go inside this kind of uh, solutions then you can do uh, such things you can compress the solution significantly in fact you can uh, half the solution by following the steps in the reverse order so in that case if you start the solution like that you will not be able to write uh, things like let g by n be abelian because there you have this is also a starting point this is also a starting point so for any a and b in g 
uh, you, you will just have not just implications but equivalent statements. So from that both the sides will be simultaneously true. But anyway, now let us see the other side. Okay. So now what is given? This is given to us. x n y n we want to prove that this is equal to y n x n x y n okay now in place of x y we can write y x x inverse y inverse x y n because you can see that this ultimately becomes the identity element but now using the associative law you have this but because of our hypothesis now this belongs to n so this coset is actually nothing but n itself so that means we have y x n which is y n x n. So this is Abelia. Now it's over. Let's see the next one. Suppose that G has a normal subgroup, has normal subgroups, okay, two normal subgroups. K and N. All right, such that. The factor groups G over K and G over N are, are abelian. So the, both the factor groups are given to be abelian. And additionally, if the groups K and N intersect trivially, if their intersection only has the identity element, show that G is abelian. Okay, so here we can immediately take the help of the previous exercise because we know that we have uh, normal subgroups for which the corresponding factor groups are abelian. So that condition with the commutator uh, that is going to be satisfied for both K and N. Since This and this are both abelian. It follows that A inverse B inverse AB belongs to K and A inverse B inverse AB belongs to N 
for all elements A and B in G. And I need to also write where we are getting this from by the previous exercise. Okay, so that means that is A inverse B inverse AB belongs to both K and N, which of course has only one element E in it for all A and B in G. So that means this element is consistently going to be just E regardless of what A and B are. In other words, for all A and B in G, A inverse, B inverse, AB is equal to E. So A inverse, B inverse is the inverse of BA. And this equation now, of course, implies that AB is equal to BA, and which is true for all A and B in G. Thus, G is abelian. Okay, so that is the solution. This is not very long. Next. For 18. Did we do for 17 just now? Yes. Let G have a normal subgroup N. Yeah, this one is going to be a little long. Okay, so there is a group G which has a normal subgroup N show that the subgroups of the factor group So that the subgroups of the factor O, oh, um, okay, okay, I just wrote factor group, it's not written here. Unnecessarily, I wrote factor group. G by N are precisely of the firm H by N where H is a itself a subgroup of G with this property that N is contained in H. Something else is also there. Furthermore, 
the second condition is uh, the second part is about the normality of these subgroups show that h is normal in g if and only if h over n is normal in g over n. The statement itself is also somewhat long and the proof is also going to be long. I said proof because it's actually a theorem. It's called the correspondence theorem. Uh, we will see what its significance is once we get to the part that deals with homomorphisms, isomorphisms, those things. Okay, but now we are going to prove it now itself. So what it states is that for a group G and a normal subgroup N, the subgroups of the factor group G by N are actually of this form, H by N, where H itself is a subgroup of G that contains N. Furthermore, in this setup, in this association between the subgroups of G H and the subgroups of G by N H by N, H is normal in G if and only if this is normal in G by N. It's a very nice association. So let's now see the solution. So what we are first of all going to do in the solution is that we are first of all going to consider such a subgroup H that contains N inside of it and prove that this set is a subgroup of G by N. And then conversely what we are going to do, we are going to consider an arbitrary subgroup of G by N and show that it is of that form. So let us do that. Let H be a subgroup of G with N being a subset of H. Okay. Note that okay. So now our uh, aim first of all is to prove that H by N is a subgroup of G by N. We already know that H by N is a subset of G by N. Why? How? That's because. The elements in H by N look like this, Hn, these cosets where H is coming from H, but if H is coming from H, then of course H is also coming from G because this is a subgroup of G. So that means these cosets are after all elements in G by N. So we already know that this is a subset subset of G by N. Okay. Now we need to prove that it's a subgroup of G by N. So the first thing we need to make sure is that it is a non-empty subset. And then only we can go for verifying the subgroup uh, conditions. So let us show this non-emptiness first. Note that for any, uh, should I write it somewhat like this or should I show that it has a specific element in it? Let me go for a specific element. Note that En belongs to this C 
spins E belongs to H. So this is a non empty subset of G by N. Again, I am saying that the fact that this is a subset of G by N is almost obvious. So, we are not going to uh, spend any more time explaining that. Okay. Now, let, now that the non emptiness is uh, okay, let us consider two elements. Let H1 and H2 belong to H. Then, and uh, I mean the corresponding elements in H by N are going to be H1N and H2N, these two concepts. So, let, let us first consider their product, which of course is H1, H2N, and this belongs to this. Why? Because h1 h2 belongs to h and this is where the fact that h is a subgroup comes into play and the inverse of h1 n is we already know what its inverse is in the larger uh, factor group it is nothing but h1 inverse n but again, since H1 is in H, so H1 inverse is in H. So this is in this. So now we can uh, say that H over N is a subgroup of G over N. So, this is a subgroup of G of R. So, that means we have uh, shown one half of what we are, uh, what we say back there. Now, we want to prove the other half. But let me, before I go for that, let me just see if I am missing something. They are of precisely this far, where H is a sub, no, fine, okay. In one direction, it's over. Conversely, this converse part is uh, less obvious. Conversely, let K be any subgroup of G by N. Now we have to prove that K is of the firm H by N for some H. Now it is that H that we first of all have to figure out and that H is going to be this. Consider the set and uh, let us not call it H, but let us call it K prime, because it, it is it, it's going to come from K. Let me define K prime to be the set of those elements in G for which the coset Gn belongs to K. It makes sense because do not forget that K is a subgroup of G by N. So that means K is a subset of G by N. So the elements in K are going to be cosets of N. So that's why uh, this definition makes sense. Particularly this condition makes sense. So let me repeat once more. K prime is precisely the set of those elements in the original group 
which give us the cosets uh, that lie in K. Okay. So now what we want to first of all prove about this K prime is that this K prime is a subgroup of G. We can already see that it's a subset of G. Do not make the mistake of thinking that the elements in K prime are cosets. No, they are or ordinary elements from G. Only the condition defining this K prime involves cosets. Okay, so our first step now is to prove that K prime is a subgroup of G. For that, we again need to first of all show that K prime is a non-empty subset of G. Note that. And in fact, we are uh, at once going to show something more than non-emptiness, which will have non-emptiness as a consequence. We will simply not, I mean, we are not just going to show that K prime is non-empty, but in fact, that K prime contains the subgroup N itself inside of it. For any N belonging to N, we have, you look at this coset, N, N. Since N is coming from N, this is nothing but the coset N itself, which belongs to K. Why is N an element of K? Because K is a subgroup of G by N. So, besides other things, K will contain the identity element of G by N, which is N. So that's where it is coming from. Thus, so because of this condition, N will belong to K prime. So any element of N is again in K prime, which implies that N is a subset of K prime. So if I hold this rag a certain way, then it's cleaning the board. But if I move it horizontally, then things get smeared. I don't know why. Which implies that this is contained in k prime in particular k prime is non empty okay now let us take two elements in k prime. so now we can uh, verify those two conditions for uh, k prime to be a subgroup let K1 and K2 be two elements in K prime, which may be equal, may not be equal, we don't know, and we don't need to know. Then, by the uh, condition, by the definition of K prime, K1 N and K2 N both belong to the subgroup K. Since K is a subgroup of G by N. We have we are going to have two things K one, K two, N, which is K one, N, K two, N. This is first of all going to be an element of K because K is a subgroup. So it's going to be closed under the product. And also it will contain all of the inverses of its elements. So it, in particular, it will contain the inverse of K1N, which is K1 inverse N. Now look at this condition, the coset K1, K2, N belongs to K and the coset K1 inverse N belongs to K. So that these things put K 
वन के टू एंड के वन इनवर्स इन के प्राइम दस एंड दिस इज अ सब ग्रुप This is a subgroup of G. Now note that we have managed to prove that K prime is a subgroup of G. Also, it contains N. So K prime now almost looks like H. Now the only thing we have to recognize is the fact that our subgroup K of G by N is actually nothing but K prime by N. Note that. But how are you going to prove this? I don't want to make it a part of the solution because for me, according to me, it's uh, very easy. But still, just for the sake of completeness, let me put it put the justification for this within brackets. So if you consider if you are going to consider an element from K, what well, uh, okay? But uh, be careful. An element from K is going to be a coset of N. It's not any ordinary element. Say you consider G N. Belonging to K. Okay. So G N is just any element from K where G is coming from capital G, of course. But if you go back to the definition of K prime, K prime consists of precisely those elements small g for which G n belongs to K. So this implies what? G belongs to K prime. And if G belongs to K prime, then G n by definition of quotients. belongs to this so that means k is a subset of this conversely if you take any element of k prime by n say k n where k belongs to k prime now because k belongs to k prime by definition of k prime k n should belong to k because that's how k prime has been defined so this proves that any element in k prime by n is in k so this is also a subset of k and that's how the two things are equal so now we have realized the arbitrary subgroup k of the factor group g by n also in that form so that means uh, now the other uh, direction also has been proved but we are not over yet we still have to answer that normality part so uh, what is it now now we have to do we have to now prove that if a okay let me just simply write let h b a subgroup of g with n contained in h 
we have to now prove that h is normal in g if and only if h by n is normal in g by n that's what we have to prove so first let so here also we have to prove two things first let h be normal in g now to prove the normality of h by n in g by n we are going to choose one element from g by n one element from h by n and then uh, form that uh, product something inverse times something times something uh, prove that it belongs to h by n so let g belong to g and h belong to h then G n inverse H n G n. We know what it's going to be. G inverse H G n. Okay, so now uh, what we want to show is that this element is in h by n but it is let, let let's first write that it is and then we will justify why it is so since g inverse h g belongs to h and this since comes from the fact that h is normal in g so this is normal in G by N. Now conversely let again I have a tendency to write g more than h immediately whenever group comes i will just simply write g it's a bad habit conversely let h by n be normal in g by n now we need to prove that h is normal in g so again let us consider two elements so this time we choose g prime in g and h prime in h then using the fact that h by n is normal in g by n we can write something then g prime n inverse h prime n g prime n is going to be an element in h by n that's what we get directly from the normality of h by n in g by n And this implies that this coset belongs to H by N, which means what? That this is an element in H by N, but we know what the elements in H by N look like. So this particular coset is also going to have to look like that. This is equal to something, some say alpha N for some 
alpha belonging to H. Okay. So this implies now we already know that this element itself g prime inverse h prime g prime is in the coset that we see in this left side. So that means that element is going to be here also. alpha beta for some beta in n okay naturally because if this belongs to the quotient then it should have that form now this is the point where we are going to use the fact that n is a subset of h Note that alpha is coming from H and beta is coming from N. Now combine that with the fact that N is a subset of H, so beta is also after all coming from H. Since we have and so Alpha and beta are both coming from H and H is a subgroup, so alpha beta belongs to H. In other words, G prime inverse H prime G prime, this belongs to capital H. So that's it that uh, proves that capital H is a normal subgroup of G. So now it's over finally. So this result is important because it tells us exactly what the subgroups in a factor group look like. But let us continue. Let G be an abelian group. show that the elements of finite order in G form a normal subgroup subgroup in and that the only element of finite order and that the only element of finite order in the factor group P by N is the identity element. Okay, let's
let us now see this one. What it says is that, oh, I enlarged it a little bit. Did I lose focus? Now it's okay. Okay, so uh, let so now we have an abelian group G. We have to show that the elements that are of finite order in G, they are of course going to form a subset of G. That is actually a normal subgroup of G, which we are calling N. And we also have to prove that the elements of finite order in that factor group, which comes by considering G and N, is the identity. Besides the identity, there is no other element of finite order in the factor group. So let us now see this. So we already have a name for our subset N and what the elements in N are? They are precisely those elements in G which are of finite order. And also it's given that G is abelian. G itself may not be finite, it may be infinite. Clearly, the identity element in G belongs to N because it has finite order, its order is 1. It's the only element of order 1 in any group. So, in our attempt to prove that N is a subgroup of G, we have considered two elements A and B. Then the order of A and the order of B are finite, that means they are positive integers. Now if you consider this power of the product where the exponent is the product of the powers then using the one of the rules of exponents well uh, okay let me just first write it and then i'm going to say something in this step, we have not used any rule of exponent, but the fact that the group is abelian. The abelian nature of the group allows us to write this power as a product of these two powers. You want to see why? We already have, I think, proved this fact previously in some exercise. But it happens like this. Say you have two here. By applying the definition of square, this is AB AB. But because of G being abelian, the BA can be written as AB. So that's how you get A square B square. So that same fact we have used here, except maybe this is not 2, but some positive integer. Okay, so now we are going to use one of the rules of exponent. And we will write it like this. Now you know that in one or two steps you are ultimately going to get the identity. So this proves what? This proves that there is at least one power of AB with positive exponent that gives us identity. So that means the order of AB is finite. This implies this is finite and so AB belongs to N because N has precisely those elements of finite order. Also, something else that we already know is that the order of A inverse is equal to the order of A. And so A inverse also belongs to N. And hence, 
A inverse belongs to N. Thus, N is a subgroup of G since G is abelian, N is normal. Okay, so we have uh, shown uh, this much. After this, we have to uh, still prove that the only element in the factor group G by N which has finite order is the identity. So for that, let us consider one element, let Gn belong to G by N such that the order of Gn is finite. Okay, then Okay, uh, should I name this something, I mean call it some A or B or K, will that be helpful? Uh, it's okay, we can just simply work with this itself. Then, by applying the definition of this order, if you consider this power then you should get the identity element which is n or now this can also be written as this or from this itself it follows that this ordinary element in the original group G belongs to n but n has all the elements of finite order so that means this element itself has finite order thus and uh, let us call at least let's call this one something let's call it k Thus k which is this power of g has finite order. Okay, should I call this one k or should I call the order itself k? Let me call the order itself k. The order of this is finite. Then k is not a group element but a positive integer. Okay, so now if someone raises this itself to the kth power, then we should get the identity. That is what I am trying to say is this. Because k is nothing but the order of this element, raising the element to the kth power is going to give us the identity and now because we are not dealing with cosets but ordinary group elements so the identity is just e now using that rule of exponent you get this not carefully that this order order of the coset gn by definition is a positive integer k also itself being an order is a positive integer so their product is a positive integer this proves that the order of g itself is finite and so g must belong to n but then G 
gn is equal to n. So the arbitrary element that we chose in gyn, which we consider to be an element of finite order, has turned out to just be the identity element. That was the claim. So now it's over. And there is one more exercise. Let's just do it and complete this uh, set of exercises. Let G P A non abelian group show that Show that there it's about some subgroup. Show that there exists H of G which satisfies these conditions such that the center of G is a proper subset of H and H itself is a proper subset of G. Okay, so let's start. Since G is non abelian, the first of all, the center of G cannot be the entire G due to its non-abelian nature. So it itself will be a proper subset of G. So that means we will be able to find at least one non-central element. So we are now going to choose one side. Choose some element G in G which does not belong to the center. Now what we are going to do now uh, I mean, based on this G, we are now going to define a subset of capital G. And let us call it CG. Its definition goes like this. It consists of those elements in G which commute with this uh, G. Now what kind of subset can it be? Our claim is that it is actually a subgroup. And it is in fact the subgroup H that we are seeking. Now because the video has become quite long, I don't, I have no idea how long it is at this point. So let me quit writing the words and instead I, let me just simply show the thing. So what I want to prove is this. Uh, along with that I also have to show that CG is a subgroup. So let's come to the subgroup first. Note that E and G both belong to CG. Why? Because E already commutes with every group element. So E in particular commutes with small g also. And G of course trivially commutes with G. GG is equal to GG. So this means that CG is non-empty. So let us now consider two elements A and B in CG. Then this implies what? A commutes with G and B also commutes with G. And that is going to imply 
that a b commutes with g why because a b g is a times b g by associative law in place of b g you can write g b you use associativity once more this becomes a g b and then this becomes g a b use associativity once more you get g a b okay so that means a b belongs to c of g also a g equal to g a if you pre multiply on both sides uh, a inverse then not bothering about associativity anymore because we, are, we know that there is no need to consider brackets then you are going to get g equal to a inverse g a now post multiply on both sides by a inverse so that gives us so you see that just like a commutes with g a inverse also commutes with g so that's how we know that cg is a subgroup of g so obviously cg is contained in g but why is cg a proper subgroup of g that is because if cg were equal to g then every element of g would have commuted with small g naturally because that is the definition of small uh, i mean that is the definition of cg let me repeat where is the case that cg is equal to g then this would have implied that hg is equal to gh for all h in g but that makes g what that makes g a central element which is not what it is we have chosen g specifically outside the center so this would have been a contradiction so that's why cg cannot be equal to g it has to properly be contained in g it, it has to be a proper subgroup of g okay now what about the center if you take a central element then by the nature of central elements it commutes with everything in particular it also commutes with g and that in turn makes it an element in cg so that's how you know that the center is contained in cg but the center cannot be equal to cg why because if the center is equal to cg let me write it at least in symbols then the fact that g itself belongs to cg would have implied again this thing which is not true so that's why the center although it contains i mean it is contained in cg it cannot be equal to cg so this is this containment is also proper just like this one so that's how the non abelian nature of the group g implies that there is such a subgroup in this subgroup has a name of so it's called the normalizer or centralizer of the element g sometimes it's also denoted by the notation in the, we will come across it in the 7th chapter i think 
So with that, this uh, current set of exercises is over. And uh, tomorrow also we have our upload. And tomorrow, of course, we are going to do analysis. So see you tomorrow with analysis. Until then, this is me, Lucifer from a mathematical group. Have a nice night.